topic called significant scriptures. Everybody should have some significant scriptures. I know the Bible, all of it is important, but let's start over here. Um, let's start at, where do I want to start from? Um, well, I guess my first significant scripture would be uh, Psalm 2, verse 8, in my own personal life. So you can go ahead and go there if I have you turned somewhere else before that. But what, what do I mean by a significant scripture? When you're reading the Bible, and hopefully all of, all of us read the Bible from time to time, it's good to read the Bible from time to time. It's good to read the Bible every day. Um, sometimes it's good to read. Some people read a lot of scripture at one time, which is good. And, or sometimes people read just enough to get what the Lord wants them to read. Or sometimes a person will read, read just a few verses and meditate on that. There's no wrong way to do it, reading your Bible, just, but the purpose is getting in the Word of God and letting the Holy Spirit lead us. That's the purpose, really, the whole, of the, the scriptures. So every one of us should have some... As we grow in our mature in our Christian life, we should have some significant scriptures that we can always say, this is how God led me, and you can point this scripture. My father-in-law, of course, I had already started it, but my father-in-law was, um, he was, he was saved out of heathen background and got saved when he was in the military and then started raising a family for the Lord. But when he got saved and he started growing and the Lord started leading him, and he went to Papua New Guinea, but how did, how did he get led in? The Lord just led him. Every time the Lord gave him a scripture and the topic or whatever, he marked it and he has dates. I mean, he's, he's much better at this than I have been over the years, been more faithful at it. But I just want to share you, uh, with you a few significant scriptures in my life that have led me to where I am today. And so in, as introduction, I want to uh, think about my, my own personal history. I know that not everybody in here is going to have the same history, but I do know this church has been here for a long time and there are many children here, youth, even some young families maybe that have grown up in this church and grown up around the Word of God. So I would relate to you and maybe you would relate to me a little bit, but um, it's hard to really come, I mean, it's really hard to find people in our generation now that have the same history background. I wasn't raised with the television at all. I'm not, I'm not saying this to be proud or arrogant or anything like that, but how the Lord was able to lead me to go to New Guinea, I think ties in greatly to how much we're in, I was influenced or wasn't influenced by the world. So we didn't have a television in our house. Um, we didn't have any video games either, for, for that matter. Um, we didn't have the internet, actually. You know, that was like way back in the day um, before the internet. And um, nothing to program my mind away from the wisdom from God. Always a goal in mind to seek the will of God. Always reading the Bible, meditating on Scripture, memorizing the Word of God at the Christian school that I went to. Godly parents, of course. Um, a godly pastor. I grew up under Dr. Don Green, if anybody knows that name. Um, school teachers, I was counting at the other, oh, a couple of years back, I was trying to go through the whole list in my mind of people that influenced me from the time I was born to the time I started deputation, at least. It was about 100 people of both male and female godly teachers in my life. Of course, my, my parents would be included in that list. And a regular and steady introduction to missions and missionaries working in many countries. These missionaries would come. Our church was big in missions as well. And I'd sit down them with them, especially when I was in my youth, and asking them questions. And after the Lord called me to go to Papua New Guinea, at the age of 13, I would sit down with the missionaries, especially that were going to New Guinea, and talk to them and ask them questions. From this point of mind, um, should be a keen, and I'm talking to you that have had this maybe a little bit in your life, should have a keen uh, to a mind and life and in tr time to hear the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. And so, uh, I just want to before we go to those significant scriptures, I want to read John sixteen really quick. Uh, John chapter sixteen. You can turn there if you want. John chapter sixteen, verse thirteen. Of course, we know this is Christ Jesus. He's talking to the disciples. The 11 disciples that are still left, Judas has gone to, to betray him. So this is some of my favorite chapters in all the Bible because it's really just the Lord bearing his heart to us Christians of the hardships and the trials that we're going to face. But we have this Holy Spirit that leads us and guides us into all truth. John chapter 16, verse 13. I'll read this. Howbeit when he... The spirit of truth is calm. He will guide you into all truths. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show it 
show you things to come. So in this verse here, it goes to show you that we're going to not necessarily every time that we read the Bible, we're going to say, oh, now I know exactly what God's will is for my life, because there's not any verse in the Bible that says, Mark Helsman, go to Papua New Guinea. Or Brother Terrell, go to the go preach to the Muslims or whatever. Or go do this. But the Holy Spirit's there as you read the Bible. And it'll give you thoughts. It'll give you ideas. He'll have you remember some of the preaching that you've heard. And maybe he'll bring to memory something that you have read or something you have memorized in the Word of God. And so we have the Holy Spirit that comes and makes indelible impressions on our mind of what he wants us to do in our life. So that's why we need to be in the scriptures. That's why we need to be in church. That's why we need to be attentive and not be distracted by so many things that are, oh man, this, this day and age, so many things that are um, trying to make indelible impressions on our, on our mind. So many deterrents, so many things that distract us from what God wants us to do. So we have this through the reading of the scriptures. Psalm 119, verse 105 says, the, the word, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding and all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. And that's how every Christian should be. It's not just for a missionary. It's not just for a pastor. It's for every person that's born again. The Lord wants us and has given us the Holy Spirit and he wants to lead us through that. So keep those in mind. So the first significant scripture the Lord has given me is back in Psalm chapter 2, verse 8. I really don't need to turn there, but I'll turn there with you. You probably know it already by memory, or maybe you know it by knowing that chapter. The whole chapter really is God the Father talking God to God the Son. And so because Christ is receiving this word from the Father, and I am in Christ, I can claim this verse, not out of context too much, but it says in Psalm 2, verse 8, it says, Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. This is when I was 13 years of age. I read this. Of course, I read it probably several times before that time. But the Lord, when I, when I read that, my own personal Bible devotion reading, the Lord said, spoke to me in my mind and said, I want you to go to Papua New Guinea too. I want you to go. And even though it was such a, uh, for me, in, in my little introverted, oh, um, backward mindset, and we were the poorest of all the church members, and we were the, probably the poorest Lansing, oh, Pastor, I was, I'm from Lansing, Michigan, sorry, people from Lansing. And, but on the other side, I probably was raised in the most spiritually, financially wealthy families in all of Lansing, Michigan. So I claimed this. I said, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to get to New Guinea. I mean, I don't, I don't even have, I don't even have a, a job right now where I can make any money to, to buy any tickets. Of course, I'm only 13 years old. But, but it was at this, this was a, really a turning point for me. And I don't know how it was for you or how it will be for you as you're reading the Word of God. But I, I claimed that promise. I said, okay, Lord, you want me to go to New Guinea. I don't even know really all the thought that came to my, my mind, but I, I know the Lord wanted me to go to New Guinea by reading that verse. And it was right around the time that John Gray had come back from New Guinea, and he had been there a term, and he had, he had gotten beat up by the rascals, and he had stayed in New Guinea uh, enough time where he got rid of his bitterness, because he told the Lord, he said, if I go back to America, because he had to get some eye surgery, they pretty much almost And so he said, if I don't get right with, with these people, get my heart right, and get rid of the bitterness, I probably won't come back to New Guinea. So he got his heart right with the people there, even though it was only you know, a group of men, real rascals that beat him up. He got that settled, came back, and he related that story. And so that story and his willingness to go back, and the Lord showed me this, and he said, I want you to go work with Brother John Gray. Really, was, was the intent. I didn't know how it was all going to work out. I, I didn't know it was going to take such a long time because I had talked to my pastor and told him my desires. And he said, probably in about 10 years, you should be able to get to Papua New Guinea because I had to finish high school. I had to go to Bible school. I had to go to deputation. Well, then it ended up, ended up being much longer than 10 years. And the Lord had a lot of things from our family to go through to prepare us for the hardships that were in New Guinea 
giving us hardships in America. So around that same time, the Lord gave me my first paying job, a $3 job to cut the grass at the church. You know, of course, it's Lansing, Michigan, so we can't cut the grass when it's snowing, so there's only a certain amount of time that we can cut the grass every week, but I was getting three bucks a week now. So I said, now I can start giving to Faith Promise Missions. I can start giving to mission. Uh, I can have a part that way. I was helping my dad in the printing ministry there at the church and cold aiding, but I didn't really think that I was having an impact, although it, those Bibles did probably get into the hands of people that got saved in Mexico and um, other countries. Of, there was a French languages he was printing and um, Italian languages and Arabic con uh, languages, uh, language and other, other languages, of course, English. So I started giving 75 cents a week to missions, and that's where my starting place was in the giving side. In that same time frame, the, a bus um, captain of a bus ministry at the art church had, he asked me if I would join in with the bus ministry and help out on the bus, you know, all the kids that were my age to help, help them when they get on the bus, go up to the door, help out on visitation. And so I took on responsibility of sweeping the, the bus every morning before we got on the road. So these are some of the things that the Lord started to allow me to do in the ministry. So this is, if you have a f first point, I try to alliterate it a little bit, but it's called the start. The start in my life of significant scriptures was right here in this verse here of the Lord. It said, ask of me. And I did. I asked the Lord, and he started um, giving me uh, work, had to give to missions. He gave me work that I could work in ministries, the bus route, um, participation, Bible production, blessing my parents, and working with the heathen in Lansing, Michigan, and the heathen in Papua New Guinea, each were, are equally valuable in God's eyes. And the Lord says, ask of me, and I will give the heathen for an inheritance, the value of the value of going out and winning the people, whether you're in Anchorage or where the Lord calls you to Timbuktu, there's a value in being a witness and a value in significant scriptures. The key is start where you are. This is the start. Wherever you are, wherever, I mean, you might have been saved out of heathen lifestyle and you didn't have that, but that's where you start reading the Bible and you start coming to church and you continue your Bible reading and continue coming to church and let the Lord lead, lead you. And someday the Lord will just give you a pop, an idea in your head as you're reading the Word of God and direct your path to go where He wants you to go, to do what He wants you to do. So the next point is, is the Lord gave me in Psalm 18, verse 43, and I call this the strivings. The first was the start, and the second is the strivings. It's a battle. The ministry and the work of the Lord is not easy. It's a, it's a it's a striving, but I want to approach it from a different standpoint initially in this point, Psalm verse 18. I need to turn to this one because I don't have it memorized. Psalm chapter 18, verse 43. As I was reading in my youth, I, the Lord had already called me to go to New Guinea. I don't know if I was still in high school or near that time of graduating high school. In Psalm 18, verse 43, I was reading this. And in light of me going to New Guinea, this verse says, Thou hast delivered me from the strivings of the people, and thou hast made me the head of the heathen. And going back to the verse that I already knew about in Psalm 2, verse 8, a people whom I have not known shall serve me. And this is going back, I mean, I had already been working in the bus ministry, and there are a lot of people that knew me in Lansing, but now I'm going to be going to New Guinea, and those people don't know me. And then going back to people that I don't know are going to serve me, I'll, I'll, the Lord started Show me deputation. You know, the people are going to have to give you some money to help service you to get to Papua New Guinea. And so I was thinking about the first part, though. It says, God had delivered me from the striving to the people. I didn't really have, I mean, when you go to, to a mission field or go to another country, you're kind of out, out of the loop in the politics scene of your, the country you went out from. And all the strife that that we have, of course, when I come back on furlough or come uh, on, on deputation, we, I still had somewhat to say when it came to politics or voting and that kind of stuff. But when I was in the public Guinea, I didn't have that opportunity. And I never get, did figure out how to do um, the voting when I was in Papua New Guinea for America. So the Lord was showing me that you're not going to be part of the striving that you 
most, most Americans have of trying to um, buy a house and buy a car and all the effort and the goals, the goals that most uh, Americans have. And it's not always wrong because many Christians and godly people have to live in America and continue being faithful here. But in my own personal significant scriptures, God was showing me that I wasn't going to have to have the same have the same strivings as the average American, the average person in my church. So our, my goals were different. My purpose was different. When I was, I had just graduated high school and people would say, well, what, what are your goals, Mark? What, are you going to go to college? You're going to have some kind of career? And I said, I just want to be, I know I already was going to go to New Guinea, but I wanted to, everything to do that I was going to do in planning and preparing was that, that was my final goal. Whatever came, and I didn't have the money at the time to go to New Guinea. I was able to go the first time on my first survey trip in 1996. And I was, what, 20 years of age. And now I had some jobs. I was working. The Lord had prospered the $3 job. And I was getting more work as I was in 14, 15, 16 years of age. And those first three years before I got my driver's license, I was pulling my, my dad's lawnmower. The first year, I think I got a lawnmower. The second year. And my dad's lawnmower on a little flat wagon that was tied to my bicycle with a weed eater and a, and a gas can. And I'd go to these different houses every year. God gave me a new one. And then that neighbor would tell me about the next door neighbor. And then by the time I graduated high school, I think I was maybe making like 350 bucks a week on just the weekend. I thought that was pretty good money at the time back in the what era was that, 90s, I think, in the 1990s. That was a lot of money. Um, in, in Lansing, Michigan, it was, anyways. <clears throat> I think I was averaging about 20 bucks an, an hour was the amount of work I did. So, but it, but I was setting that aside. I wasn't wasting. I was putting the, you know, in my savings account. But then the need came up to buy some paper for the Bibles that my dad was printing for Papua New Guinea. So all that went into that. And so no money for uh, my first trip into Papua New Guinea. So I started just praying, and the Lord provided. Because my goal was to go to Papua New Guinea. However, God provided I was going to go to Papua New Guinea. I couldn't rush there. I didn't really have, I wasn't like from a wealthy family where I could just drop everything and buy a ticket and go whenever I wanted to. So the striving is my goals, my purpose, but everything was in light of going to Papua New Guinea. And everyone, every one of us need to find out what God has a purpose in our life and shoot for that. Find out some significant scriptures. The goals and striving God had given to the Helzerman family and me in particular, is different than the average person in this life. God has delivered me from the things most people strive for, and he has given me another purpose to fight for. Like I said, I mean, whatever you're doing now, working a job, tithing, giving to missions, helping this church stay faithful, is what God has for you right now. Don't think that, oh, you're not a missionary, or you're not exactly like I am, or exactly like the pastor is, but where are you right now? What significant scriptures have led you to where you are right now? We see some, I don't have time to go to all these um, thoughts, but I'll just look at a couple. Luke chapter 13, and it talks about striving. We know when, it's, when we're talking about striving, there's uh, what, something you fight for or something that you are, you're, you're purpose-driven. You're, what is your purpose, your goals? We need to strive to win souls to Christ. Look at Luke 13. Luke chapter 13, verse 24. Just think about some significant scriptures that you can put your faith and confidence in the Lord that's leading you and guiding you to follow. Luke 13, and verse 24, let me read this. It says, strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and not be able. And that gives us a purpose. I mean, this is our Christian life. I know we don't have to work our way to heaven. But, but we're, it's that striving, it's that, pur that purpose is in relation to our salvation. And then that striving should until in our preaching, I know that everybody in here is not a preacher per se, but everyone has a ministry in that aspect. If you're a mother, you're a preacher to your children. If you're a Sunday school teacher, you're a preacher to your Sunday school students. If you're a junior church worker, you're a preacher to those children. If you go work in the jails, you're a preacher. If you're a pastor, if you're a missionary, even if you're just a child, 
you can minister and edify your other siblings in the work of the Lord. If you go over to Romans 15, Paul's talking here, of course, to the church at Rome. Rome, Romans, I keep on saying Rome. Rome is how we say it in pigeon. Rome, chapter 15. Line 20. <laughs> chapter 15, verse 20. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel. Now where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. So everywhere we go, we need to be a witness. Pass out gospel tracts. Strive to preach. Strive to to publish the word of God. Now there's another one in the same chapter in verse 30 talking about a purpose in our Christian life, the preaching of our Christian life, and the prayer of our Christian life is in verse 30. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. So in my own personal life, my striving toward prayer was to pray for these missionaries in New Guinea. It was to pray for my pastor, pray for my parents, pray for other missionaries around the world. And then, of course, in our being pleasing to God in 2 Timothy chapter 2, our striving should be pleasing to God. Whatever we're striving in, whatever our goals are, whatever our purpose is, it should be to please the Lord in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, 4, and 5. And oh, yeah, three, verse 3. Now therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, and if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husbandman, that, I guess I'll finish there. But it's talking about striving in these verses, the warfare, the, the purpose, the goal that we have in this Christian life is to be pleasing to God. Let's go to 1 Corinthians as our last thought in the strivings. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 now. Hope I'm not boring you too much. I love... I love um, New messages, sometimes they don't go as well, and sometimes they do, but um, as I was, actually I started musing on this days ago, but this morning the Lord woke me up and early and said, you need to start meditating on this, you need to start writing these things down. I didn't know exactly if I was preaching today or when I was preaching next, but this is the time, I guess. First Corinthians chapter, what did I say? Chapter 9, thank you. Verse, what did I say? I haven't said it yet, I don't think. Verse 23. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partakers thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? Am I in the right verse? Verse 23, yep. So run, that ye may obtain. That's talking about the striving. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. So as we think about that, I just stop. Sometimes when I'm thinking about when I'm reading a verse, I just had to stop right there and just get the continuity of what's being said there. What did it say? It's temperate in all things. That means that as, our, as we set our goals and we have our purpose in mind and what God wants us to strive for, sometimes there's going to be temptations to veer off course or to be get sidetracked or to get away from what God wants us to get in our life. There was a couple of instances in our life, we don't have time to belabor these points, but my wife was, well, um, Tabitha, she just got married in July. I have never met her before, but she was on the video. She was 10 months old, our first child. We were new at everything, new and somewhat doing some ministry there at our church and, and new parents and new married. We, we hadn't been married, but it may be what, hardly a year, I guess it was. And uh, I guess... It wouldn't have been a year, that would be right. We got married, and then we had the nine months of pregnancy, so ten months, okay, so we, almost what, almost two years. Everything's new, as you know, newlyweds. And someone, an older couple, came into our church, and they hadn't been there very long, but they 
head this complex that you shouldn't discipline children, spank or whatever word you want to use in this day and age. It's hard to, we shouldn't say too much about it because people are listening. But she turned us into social services just to kind of, you know, try to make us be afraid of correcting because they didn't believe in it because they were older people and they, she, this particular woman that made the telephone call, her, she, they had, she and her husband had disciplined or trained their girls, but one had turned into a lesbian, so now she had the idea that it was their fault that, so they said, we, we're, we're against any kind of correction at all. So anyway, she thought that we were trying to train too much on Tabitha when she was 10 months old, and we weren't using any corporal punishment, as really, but anyways, we got into the system, we got turned into to social services, we had a six-month legal battle with the state of Michigan because we lost custody of Tabitha as a 10-month-old baby. That's, that's a hard thing to go through. I didn't. I mean, I was naive. I mean, when they came to our house, we told them everything that we did, you know, saying the word no to her and making, you know, doing whatever we did. And we just were honest with these people. We didn't realize that this lady that came to our house, she was a Hillary wannabe. It was back in the days of Hillary and Clinton. And they were trying new new ways of trying to kick out God in our in our state, I guess. I don't know, but they she took it to the nth degree, but the Lord providentially gave us a good lawyer and they have to have her have her own lawyer, you know, how the court system is. It was really bad. So that kind of slightly veered us off course. But my goal, I mean I wanted as soon as I got custody back of Tabitha, I didn't leave Dr. Don Green or the church there. I wasn't angry with the church there. I, I just wanted to leave that, that situation for a while, and I moved to another state and another church and got plugged in there to get ready to go to Papua New Guinea. Then four years of that, then there was a big problem that came up there, and the Lord got me to the church where we are now and got me shot off to Papua New Guinea. So there's these things that might come up in our life to veer us off course and get us angry or sideways or crossways with the pastor or, or maybe... A, oh, forget it, I'm not going to serve the Lord kind of attitude. But sometimes, really, what the Lord is, is putting us through a press, to press us, to strengthen us, to go through these trials, go through hardships, go through things that we're gonna, are going to make us stronger for something that's going to come up later on in our life. When I'm in New Guinea now. I'm seeing some of the challenges that we face there and trials that we face there. I don't think I would have ever been able to go through them without the trials that I went through previously. They didn't veer us off course. Um, temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, talking about from the earthly side of, side of things. But we, as Christians, as preachers, as missionaries, we, an incorruptible, and therefore so run, not as uncertainty, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So think about this to be temperate in all things. Keep that goal in mind. Keep that purpose in mind, whatever God has led you. Because those significant scriptures you've had in the past, God's going to let them come to fruition in our strivings. The start for me, the strivings for me, and the supply. How is God going to get me to public again? How is God going to continue this work, and we already, we've heard probably many messages here about giving and receiving, but really when it comes down to God providing for our everyday need, it goes in line with how our giving is. And I can relate in my own personal life, when I started giving those three, that 75 cents from that three dollars in missions, and then of course tithe on top of that, and for me, I didn't, I was trying to round up whenever I gave to tithe, it was always rounding up. So, However, it was every every time that I look back, I said, "Man, all these hand for, handfuls on purpose that have come to me, and how God has supplied our needs in Papua New Guinea, and on deputation and furlough, and um, specific needs that we had when we were out in the jungle and we couldn't get supplies and we couldn't get to any cash flow because there's no bank in Kaintiba. How God provided for our needs and provided food for us, or things like that. I, I have so many stories I don't have time to tell them, but." How God promises, or how God promised he will and would take care of our needs. And it goes back to our giving. And I don't have time to read all these scriptures, but I'm going to go to the key one that God gave to me. There's 
three in Proverbs that I want to go to, but I'll just go to Proverbs chapter 28 as a significant scripture. We already know about the start in my life and the strivings in my life and the supply. And God wants to supply for all of his children. He cares for us. He pities us. He pities us as a father does a child. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 8. As I was reading along here, I was thinking about, you know, Lord, I, I want to go to New Guinea. I don't know really how it's all going to happen. I know I had to go on deputation. But when, even when I get to New Guinea, I'm, I'm praying this. When I'm in, when I'm in Kainti, actually, Kerama now, we're already in Kerama when the Lord gives me this verse. I start praying this way. Proverbs chapter 28 and verse, what did I say? 8. He that by usury and unjust gain increaseth his substance, he shall gather it for him that will pity the poor. I'm in Kerama. There's, I mean, the Gulf province is by, without a doubt the poorest and the most uncared for province of all of Papua New Guinea because the, it's the most uneducated, the most, um, all the money that's allocated for the Gulf province and it gets in the governor's hand or the, the open member's hands, it dissipates somehow, it goes somewhere. So, especially when now Kerama is bad. But then you get up into the rural areas where we are, there's no money. I mean, I've, I've solicited the government for money to maintain the airstrip. I mean, after I was taking care of it for a year, and just to pay, you know, help them take care of the Papua New Guineans that I'm training to take care of the airstrip. And so, it, I mean, it's just like pulling teeth. And Matt Allen, when he was working in his area, trying to build an airstrip, which never, ever got done because... It's like pulling teeth. We're trying to do work. It's not, not even our work to do. And anyways, that's getting off the point. So we're, we're talking, about, I'm thinking about, I'm here in Kerman now, working with Brother John Gray, and I'm saying, Lord, look at this. There are people, heathen, that are laying up, people that are doing things unjustly and getting money unjustly, but the Bible says they're laying it up for people that will pity the poor, and look at I'm pitying the poor. And so I started, I claimed this first. I said, I don't know how it's going to happen, but if you could supply some money through this means. You know, I, I, I've been to a lot of churches. I think maybe at this point in time when I'm getting, getting to Guinea, probably 300 churches, which may be not, not a lot, but to me it seemed to be like a lot. And that, at that point in time, less than 10% of those churches had taken us out for support, and now we're in Kerama. And so I said, how about, Lord, you giving some money to an to the means of someone outside the church, someone that's a heathen. So it wasn't long after I claimed that verse that I got a telephone call, or I think that I called a friend of mine that had been a part of this other church that I was, that our family was a part of for four years, and that was a big mess. But part of that big mess, there was a man that, by unjust means, he had he had, he had sold the church building out from underneath everybody. And he wanted to take that money across state lines into Pennsylvania. And so the attorney general found out about this. I'm not sure how that happened in the state of New York, but it happened. And so they said, no, this money can't cross. You can't take this money and put it in a bank in Pennsylvania. So they said it's got to be allocated because it's a nonprofit church. You've got to actually divvy it out to people in New York that are not nonprofits. And so I didn't know this. And... So I called this fam one of those families that had gone through that hardship from the church being sold out from underneath them, and the church building, I should say, not the church. You can't sell the church, but the building. So um, he said, hey, did you hear? There's, they, already, they already wrote a check for you, and it's going to be coming to you. And he said, do you want it to go through Word for the World? And I said, yeah, you send it. And he said, he said it's, it's, uh, said, it's $9,000. I said, wow. And I come to find out and how, how I well, it was from an unjust Right there, it says an unjust, by unjust, how does it say it? I'll say it right. Unjust gain. This man was trying to get it. I mean, the church had labored and built it, you know, debt free, this church building and the property and everything was, was debt free. And he, this man was trying to take everything and move it out from underneath everybody. So he actually had sold this church building. And this is how it continues by, by heathen and ungodly men because I had included other people that this, some money would come to our ministry by someone outside the church. And he had actually sold it to a, 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 sorry, a funeral home of 
of all the things to sell a church building into a funeral home. So that funeral home, of course, that, that funeral home had already been established and had, been, had another building somewhere else, but all that money that they had to purchase that church building from the church had come from what? Dead heathen people that had paid for funerals in the past. So all this money that I got, 9000 was from people that had were mostly probably heathen that had died and people had paid for the, the funeral and they had money to, the, this company had money to pay for another church, another, well, it's another church, but in a, another funeral home. And so in, in a roundabout way, the Lord answered that prayer. And I had already been praying about trying to buy a solar set for Kain Kiba and Kira Mother's power, well, almost power, like you said, six hours on, six hours off in the day or six hours I had to get up in the, oh, how many times, and care to get up in the middle of the night and turn on the generators for the security lights. I don't miss those days at all, getting hardly any sleep. But I get up into the bush, not to worry about security lights because there's no power. But I wanted to have a solar set. So it was just a few months before we were getting ready to go to Kaintiba full time and leaving that ministry with Brother John Gray. And this money comes. And so I take it right away and I say, I'm going to buy the solar that I'd already been praying about, solar set. It was just a little bit over 9,000. Of course, I had to ship it from America over. But we got up there, got settled in. And within a few months, it came in November. And I was able to get it installed just in a few days, really, because solar power is just 12 volt. You just hook up two, line, two, two, two power cords, red and black. It's not like two-phase or 110 or 220 and all that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm not an electrician. But anyways, the Lord, the illustration is God will supply. As you give... The Lord will, will give back. And there's so many verses that I want to touch on, but I don't want to belabor the point because we already know it. The Bible says uh, in Luke chapter 6, 37, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together, and running over, shall men. It doesn't say God's going to give it to you. It says men. Somehow God's going to work in their heart, or somehow men are going to give into your bosom. For with the same measure, and of course it goes back to our giving, right? The measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. So anything how the Lord supplies our need is how it hinges on how we give. We ask God, give us our daily bread. We are content with food and raiment. I have another story that I'd like to tell you really quick if I can. It's the Nankina story. This was back in our first term, and we had just got up in Kaintipa maybe a few months, and I hadn't budgeted everything properly because with the amount of support I had, I had a budget. One month support for all the flights coming and going. Not the whole family, just either me or my wife would go out and get two months supply. So the first month support would go to purchase the flights. Going out was pretty cheap, but coming back with the 800 kgs or 600 or 700 kgs, which are kilograms, which is about two pounds a piece. So we're talking about, about not quite a ton of of either food or hardware, everything, and my body weight and my luggage, whatever we took out, we had to bring back in, plus our supplies. So we had to budget all that. So most of our money was spent in the city, Port Moresby, then we had to fly it back, and all that cost pretty much wiped out everything I had except for maybe about $100. And I tried to get some Kina, so I had about 100 Kina for one month and 100 Kina for another month, and that was. That was what we had to live off. And so we're coming down to this last week on one particular two-month two month, uh, phase of time. And this time, my wife's planning on going out. We've already purchased a ticket for her to fly out. SIL is supposed to land. We have it all scheduled. Well, then we still have the weekend to go through, plus the time that she's in the city to wait for her to get back with the food and extra food. Of course, we could buy some things at the market food-wise, but we only have nine Kina now. We're not a nine kina. I don't have the bartering system that I had yet, that I have now set up. And so we have nine kina on Friday morning, and it was election time, 2012, which would be maybe July or August something. Chris, you just left, so I can't ask her. But um, so I have nine kina left. It's Friday. My wife flies out on the next Monday, but we still have that whole week to wait for her to come back. I have nine Kina, but there's a man that I knew from Karama. He was a doctor in Karama and took care of Mary Gray sometimes when she was sick and John Gray. And I had invited him over when we lived in Karama, and he ate with us. And a pretty prominent man in Karama. So anyways, a year later, 
I'm up in Kainteba. He comes up to Kainteba candidating for a political position. And he has two, I think, two or three men with them in his entourage. He had gone up walking in the mountains, candidating with the bush people in the jungle. But he comes back. And earlier that week, he had come back. And when he's come back, he's holding this big old chunk of pig. And when they, New Guineans, in our area anyways, when they eat pig, they eat everything. Or they have delicacies. They, eat, they like to eat the brain and the eyeballs and everything that has flesh. And they like all that gross stuff that we don't like to eat, like the innards and the stomach and all that kind of stuff. And so they leave their leftovers is what we like to eat, like the rump and the back strap and all the good, wonderful part of the pig where you would have pulled pork or something. So he has this banana leaf that's all wrapped up. And I don't know what's inside of it. He said, somebody killed a pig up there for a moo, a feast. And there's some leftovers, and I want to give it to you. So I said, thanks. And so the next day is, I think the next day is Friday. So I went and saw him, and he was supposed to fly out to go to Kerama. And I said, well, if the flight doesn't come, well, I had, we, our whole family ate that whole thing of pig that night. So we didn't have much food. So I, after I invited him, and he said he would come if the flight didn't come, I said, man, why did I invite him? We have 19 left. That morning, I, I prayed to the at the meal table, that, that money would, the Lord would supply some, some means, some money somehow. So I said, man, why did I ask this guy to come and eat with us? He has three, I mean, they're big guys, bigger than I am. And he's a big fella too. And I know they were going to eat a lot. And I said, I don't have much. I have maybe a couple packets of rice left and a couple tin fish or something. So anyways, I was kind of praying that the flight would come so he could leave and I wouldn't have to entertain him. But... The flight didn't come. So I went back down later on in the afternoon to the place where he was staying. And I said, you gonna, still going to come up? And, and I was kind of hoping that he would say, no, we got someone invited us to come or whatever. But he said, no, I'll come. But then he pulled out a lot of tuchinas. And there's some on the table back there. And he said, I don't know how much is here, but why don't you buy some extra food because we're going to probably eat a lot. I said, wow, praise the Lord. So he said, I don't even know how much is here. So I counted it when I got to the store. It was for like 42 kina which was a lot of money for us at that time. I mean, that's like a quarter of what we had set aside for two months. And so I bought all the stuff, and we got some extra tin fish and oxen palm. We got some from our little canteen store and a few other things and entertained them. My wife made a nice spread. We had kumu, cow cow, rice, tin fish, all the good works of the bush food. And so they went back to the place where they were going to sleep. It's nighttime now, and I get in bed, and I'm so happy, and I count the money, and it's nine kina again. So we had enough, and we had, we had bought enough market food for the weekend, so we were okay that way. So that nine kina lasted us the next four or five days, just going really easy, easy. We say easy, easy, you know, um, very gently with the budget. And Christy came back, and we were so happy to have Christy come back that Friday, a week later from that nine kina story. So the Lord will provide. However, our situation is, is, I'd like to go to the last one, but we're running out of time, and that's the settlements. When I was, when I was going on my, the last survey trip, the Lord gave me a verse in Matthew 19, 29. I won't go there, but it says those, I, I don't, can't really quote it for, verbatim, but it says those that leave houses and fathers and mothers and children and wives and spouses or whatever, or it says God's going to reward them. And with houses, and I said, Lord, I need a place to stay when we get to Kaintiba because we don't have a house and nothing or range really in Kaintiba. And I'd already been planning to go to Kaintiba after Kerma. And so when we got to that time in 2010 when I went up to Kaintiba, this old government house that was run down was given to us, and that's how we acquired that. So, so there's the, the start in our Christian life. We need to have some significant scriptures that help us kickstart the goals for our life. We need to have verses that coincide with the strivings and continuing that. And some significant scriptures concerning the supply, how God's going to supply our every need, how God's going to supply us day by day by day. And then for me it was the settlement, the places where we were going to stay, the outcome, promises from the Father that the outcome would be from Him. Let Him have free course in your life as you read the scriptures. Because each one of us need to have significant scriptures in our life that we can always go back. When, the, when Satan tempts us, and he's going to, we have the scripture, we can go back to it. We can say, this is the time Christ saved me. This is the time God called me. This is the time God wants me to do this. And you won't be deterred. 
think about those things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I love you. Thank you for this time to stand before these sweet, gracious people. How they love you, and many of them have given and sacrificed, even their lives, have gone to mission trips, have gone to various places. I pray that you would bless this church and maintain it for your glory, but help us not to forget to get significant scriptures in our life that will govern our life, that will keep us on course when we have distractions and discouragements, even this week having the death of this sister Grace, that you might encourage this church 